so yeah, I'll uh, I'll sort of I'll just reintroduce. Um, this is Sarah Vedrovich. She's going to be talking about the events of May '68, um, a very important time, as uh, as I'm sure many of us are aware. Um, and yeah, I mean, without without further ado, I mean, I will quickly mention actually, just uh, so that all the attendees know, please use the uh, Q and A function if you have any um, questions, if you need anything answering and whatnot. Um, we're going to keep this nice and relaxed, so don't feel like you need to rush yourselves to come up with something, you know. And uh, yeah, um, without further ado, Sarah, do you want to take it away? Yeah, um, so I'm going to try and speak for about half an hour and then hopefully we'll have time for any questions. And if anyone wants to come in and actually say something, that would be great as well. Um, but yeah, I'll get going. So, so we're coming to the end of what I think has been a really inspiring and informative revolution series. And it's been really interesting to learn more about this variety of revolutions. So seeing the similarities and the differences in revolution and really getting to grips with what the successes and failures were down to. So luckily for me, I get to talk today, as I said, about one of the revolutionary movements that has always been really inspiring to me. And in my mind raises some of the key questions that we should be talking about when we talk about revolution. So I also think that this revolution is absolutely key for us to talk about as the Marxist Student Federation. And that's because this, uh, this is a really inspiring story of student and worker solidarity. So as Marxist students, we have to be aware of our place in the movement as subsidiary to workers and to stand with them and help them fight. So the Paris 68 movement shows us the amazing influence that students can have on helping to build and fight the revolution. And we should really take heed of this as revolutionary students. The May 68 movement in France was actually a rarity for historical revolutions. And that's because the situation of capitalism was on an upswing. So France was still experiencing the economic good times of the post-war boom, with the working class being given a better level of subsistence than ever before. And only weeks before the start of the May 68 movement, bourgeois journalists were commending France on having solved the contradictions of capitalism and having ended class struggle forever. What they saw was an unbeatable level of stability in French society, paired with detrimentally low levels of trade unionism across the country. The trade union movement was extremely weak in France at the time, and the ruling class was like felt really happy and secure in its position. But even the supposed Marxists and revolutionaries had written off the European working class as a road to revolution. And they saw it as being, they saw them as being like bourgeoisified, so like bought off with um, nice cars and houses and a more stable life than before. But what this revolution shows to me is two things. So firstly, how quickly a situation can turn into its opposite. So it was only a matter of weeks um, between that position and the ruling class, the ruling class having this like pride and stability in the nation to De Gaulle literally saying in a few days, the communists will have power. And secondly, is the impossibility of the situation for the ruling class once the workers begin to realize their own power. So during the build up to this revolution in France, big factories played quite a large role. But since the Paris Commune, there'd been this fear in France of large scale factories and workplaces that by their very nature have a united working class as they knew what this could lead to. However, large factories had begun to appear across the nation and the Renault factory workers played a really huge role in this revolution. And this again, to me, highlights the basic contradiction of capitalism, which is that the capitalists create their own grave diggers in a united working class. So as I previously said, the so-called revolutionaries of this time had written off the European working class. There was a scramble between them to find this like new revolutionary force in society. They were often looking to the third world to start the revolution. And this was at a time where under their noses, a revolutionary general strike was building. And May 68 proved the power of the working class and it brought class struggle firmly back onto the programme. What I mean, what had been missed by these academics and like the so-called revolutionaries of the period was the uneven growth in French society. So whilst it's obviously true to say that um, 
sorry, whilst, uh, whilst it's true that the economy was growing uh, and French workers were often living a better life than before, there was also a really clear view of the fact that the bosses were growing richer at a much faster pace than the workers. And this created a lot of complaints in French society um, about the growing inequalities. And a lesson was really coming to light for the workers, which was that however good the economy is, this will always benefit those at the top more greatly than the poorest. So in France in 1968, there were between five and six million people living below the subsistence line. And this was in a country where the rich had never been richer. The defeat of fascism in the war and the immediate economic upswing created a concept amongst the masses that they could reach for something better. And this is the mood that May 68 came off the back of. So far from being brought off, the molecular process of revolution, as Trotsky referred to it, was building, and it was building to create the most revolutionary general strike in history. And this failure to see what was building under their noses shows the real impotence of these people who had succumbed to academic Marxist ideas. They had no real link with the movement and with the workers, and therefore they had no understanding of what the processes that were occurring under the surface were. They were like engaging in pointless discourse rather than actually learning and listening to workers. But of course, theory is the linchpin of a revolutionary organization. Um, but there's a difference, I think, between understanding theoretical questions in order to apply them to your work as a revolutionary and merely debating and discussing ideas without ever having any active link to the movement or any idea of why it's important to understand them. The latter, which I think is what was occurring amongst these, um, amongst these uh, like academic Marxists, um, can lead to this like navel gazing small circle mentality, which never has any real concept of what the balance of class forces are in any given epoch. So I've kind of talked around the topic a bit there, um, but I want to lay out the events of the movement so that everyone can get a feel for, you know, the real determin determination and militancy of these events. So this movement started in Sorbonne University, which is the most famous university in France. And movements of students, whilst on their own, they're not capable of overthrowing capitalism, are often a really good barometer for the general mood of society. The students in the movement were fighting against the old order and the limits placed upon them by capitalist society. And these students were extremely militant in their actions and attitudes, which I'm sure you'll get a picture of as I go on. The original student movement began in order to protest um, an archaic rule in, in the Spahn University that meant that male and female students couldn't visit each other's dorms. However, I think as we say that, we have to be really clear that while this may have been the catalyst to this movement, 10 million French workers didn't strike so that male and female students in the Sorbonne could visit each other's dorms. Um, and this like brings up a, a comparison uh, for me with what's happening currently, because throughout the corona crisis, we've often talked about how necessity expresses itself um, by accident. Um, and this student protest really shows the exact same phenomenon, I think. So the processes are built up to allow for this general strike. And this movement, um, along with the leaders of this movement, was kind of an accidental catalyst um, that, uh, that then the movement took on a power of its own and obviously took on, um, took on uh, demands of its own and ideas of its own. Um, so it wasn't that everyone was striking over, over this demand that the students had originally, uh, had originally began to protest over. So on May the 3rd, the police um, in Saban University had tried to cover, tried to um, clear the courtyard um, to try and break up the movement that was occurring. However, the students fought back and the university was then shut down. And this was only the second time that this had ever happened in the 700 years of history of the university. And the first was when the Nazis had invaded Paris. So this shows the extent of seriousness that the ruling class saw the protest with. So these students refused to be turned back and they took to the streets of Paris to fight the battle. Fights between students and police continued for a few days. And by May the 6th, there were 500 arrested and 1000 injured but most of these injuries were actually sustained by the police, which again shows the militancy of the students. 
But the residents of Paris could see that this wasn't an attack by the students on the police, but the other way around, that the police were losing a battle which they brought violence to. And the workers were therefore persuaded to help the students fight. The French riot police, the CRS, were raiding homes and they were beating people. And within this, they really made a rod for their own backs because they directly involved the workers in a struggle that they hadn't been involved in previously. So riots ended up breaking out on May the 10th and barricades were erected by students and workers to block police attacks. And I've heard it said before that if you want to build a barricade, your best allies are the French working class. And they really proved this in May 68. One of the key things that we should be aware of as revolutionaries is the state of consciousness of the masses. So do the masses realize their own power? Do the masses know who the enemy is, capitalism? And are the masses ready to fight to protect themselves? We can also see from history that consciousness doesn't develop in a straight line. The working class can learn more about the real situation of capitalism in 10 days than it has in 10 years if the situation is correct for it. And in May 68, the workers of Paris learned more about the role of police and society in these few days than they could have done from reading a thousand books on the topic. Society had turned against the ruling class at this point, and demoralization was setting, was setting out through the ranks of the previously optimistic bourgeoisie of France. Trade union leaders were trying to ignore the movement. However, faced with growing pressure from the ranks, on the 11th of May, the unions called for a one-day general strike on May 13th. And the one-day general strike is a tactic that conciliatory unions often keep in their back pocket to quell the anger of the masses when they, when they reach out. The working class, however, cannot be turned on and off like a tap. And once the anger and militancy is out there, putting the genie back in the bottle is a tough job. The trade unions had given the workers a chance to see just how powerful they really were. And despite their desire to push the workers back into the factories and offices, this was an unlikely cause. Everything was being done to try and limit the success of the general strike. So for example, the Sabon promised to reopen on the 13th in an attempt to split the students from the workers in what was now becoming a revolutionary movement. Unfortunately for the ruling class, the bonds of solidarity had been formed and the students were unlikely to turn their backs on the revolutionary working class. The intention behind the reopening of the Sabon was summed up um, by the prime minister of France at the time. So he said, some people have thought that by reopening the Sabon and having the students released, I had shown weakness and set the agitation going again. I would simply answer as follows. Let's suppose that on Monday 13th of May, the Sabon had remained closed under police protection. Who can imagine that the crowd would have failed to break in, carrying everything before it like a river in a flood? I preferred to give the Sabon to the students than see them take it by force. So we can see from this quote the fear that the ruling class had about the movement. And on May 13th, the workers took to the streets for this general strike. Mass protests broke out in Paris, which incorporated over a million people. And the movement was made up of all types of workers. So from car factory workers to doctors and so on. And I found a really good eyewitness account that's actually quoted in um, a book called Revolutionary Rehearsals. So I just wanna read that to you guys. <coughs> Endlessly they filed past. There were whole sections of hospital personnel in white coats, some carrying posters saying, where are the missing injured? Every factory, every, every, factory, every major workplace seemed to be represented. There were numerous groups of railway men, postmen, printers, metro personnel, metal workers, airport workers, market men, electrician, electricians, lawyers, sewer men, bank employees, building workers, glass and chemical workers, waiters, municipal employees, painters and decorators, gas workers, shop girls, insurance clerks, road sweepers, film studio operators, bus men, teachers, workers from the new plastic industries, row upon row of them, the flesh and blood of modern capitalist society, an unending mass, a power that could sweep, that could sweep away everything before it if it decided to do so. So I wanna take a quick tangent away from the events here to look at this quote, because I was really blown away by the power of that memory of the strike. 
A point that's often raised by people when they question revolutionaries about our beliefs is this idea that the working class doesn't really exist anymore. Um, so that because the factories that Marx and Engels were discussing are not as prevalent as they were then, this means the whole ideology is out of date. Now, of course, workers in factories still exist in huge numbers. Clothes are still made, food is still packaged, and machinery is still built. And this is all done in factories. However, it's true to say that in the West, the picture of the working class that was painted by Engels in Conditions of the Working Class in England is not exactly mirrored in today's society. But that doesn't mean an end to the working class, and it doesn't mean an end to their revolutionary potential. In fact, I think that's a really useful lie for the ruling class to tell us in order to divide the workers into smaller sections and have us like fight amongst ourselves. What this quote really brings to light for me is what, mod what a modern revolutionary movement would look like. So this working class, despite the variety of work, were bound together with an anger at the current system and a militant mood to sweep it aside and replace it with something better. So whether the working class is in factories or in offices or in shops, they're still united by the wage slavery and the need to break from these chains of capitalism. And similarly, I think there's an important lesson to be taken from the May 68 revolution about solidarity of other sections of society. So the one I've spoken about most is the students, but they weren't the only group or class in society um, to have this solidarity with the workers. So Harvey, when he spoke about the Chinese revolution, um, he, he highlighted like the idea that placing a revolutionary movement on anyone other than the working class is, is a mistake because no other class has the same revolutionary potential and unified interests as the working class. However, it's often the case that the peasantry and certain layers of the petty bourgeoisies, the small business owners, can be useful and necessary as a support to the workers' movement. I did plan to talk about this a bit more concretely, um, but I, as I wrote this talk, I realized I didn't have enough time to do that. So if anyone you know, knows anything about that, um, about that solidarity amongst those uh, different classes uh, during this movement, then please like come into the discussion and fill out that context, because uh, that would be super useful. Anyway, um, I'll come back from my tangent to talk a bit more about the events of May. So on the 13th, a wave of occupations took place in factories and schools and workplaces. And the strike did the opposite of what the trade union leaders had hoped. So not only did it not blow off steam, it built a ferment of revolutionary potential in the French working class. Rather than leading to the workers going back to their jobs on the 14th with like a clear head ready to work for the capitalists again, this actually developed into more occupations and more strikes on the preceding day. And this included a huge strike in the Renault factory, which as I mentioned, was one of the largest factories that France had ever seen. And on the 14th, no newspapers went to print because of the strike action of print workers. And again, the print workers hold a really important piece of a revolution because without the faithful media backing up the ideas of the ruling class, workers are more in contact with each other than the bourgeoisie. This ruling class, the ruling class can try and indoctrinate workers with ideas which turn them against revolution. And of course they do that and they will continue to do that. However, it's the basic contradiction of capitalism that workers do everything. So as Ted Grant said, not a wheel turns and not a light bulb shines without the kind permission of the working class. And once the movement persuades print workers or TV and radio media workers of the need for the movement, then the ruling class loses this important part of its armor. So eventually in France, nothing could go to print that was derogatory of the strike. By May 15th, 50 factories had been occupied um, and Sorry, and by 18th, the country was shut down. So coal miners, bus drivers, and shipyard workers were all striking by this point. Public transport had stopped, and even professionals such as writers, actors, and architects were on strike. And the French state tried to get Belgian and German workers to replace the strikers, but they refused to scab. I think also the French, um, the French media tried to get uh, Belgian and German print workers to print um, derogatory uh, derogatory literature on the strikes and they wouldn't do this either. So now that capitalist society had been shut down, the workers began to organize society for themselves. Workers councils emerged across factories and other workplaces 
and the embryo of workers' rule really began to appear. So prices were fixed in shops to stop profiteering, and shops were given a special union signed badge to prove that they were charging the correct amount for their food. Picket lines were organized at petrol stations to make sure that only doctors and ambulances could get, um, could get petrol, and the strikers organized with peasant organizations to make sure that food was delivered to these rural areas. Committees came together uh, to make sure that free meals were given to striking families. And again, as with every revolutionary movement in history, women played a leading role in the organization of the new society. So once again, it was proven that the masses can organize a society for themselves without the bosses. And this is a really inspiring lesson to learn at the moment, in my opinion. I think, again, to draw a comparison with um, current events, from the start of the coronavirus shutdown, we saw a lot of local groups popping up everywhere to share resources and to get food to vulnerable people. And this shows, I think, this like the spontaneous and natural solidarity, which is extended in crisis times. And to me, this is a really good indicator of the idea that people aren't naturally greedy and closed minded and that they want to help one another. And, and this, I think, was really proven in France in May 68. And there was, again, a rapid change in consciousness and a drive towards the understanding that society doesn't need bosses and it doesn't need capitalists. By May 20th, the ruling class had completely lost control of the situation. 10 million workers were on strike, which is two thirds of the French workforce, or it was at the time, and nothing was in the hands of the capitalists anymore. So the National Assembly was in chaos, but on paper still, the ruling class had the army, it had the media, it had the schools. However, the workers who genuinely drive forward these forces were in no mood to entertain the ruling class any longer. The ruling class needs the cooperation of workers to keep things running, and they'd completely lost this in France at the time. And as I mentioned before, it's the power of class forces that makes all the difference in any situation. De Gaulle may have had the power of the state, but the working class had something much, much more powerful, which was their own unity. So by May 25th, the TV and radio workers were on strike. The 8 p.m. news had been replaced by a black screen. And as I said, the papers had to be approved by workers' representatives so that nothing anti-strike could be published. The, paper, um, the papers also published calls for people to join the strike. And the strike had an overwhelmingly large level of support from all layers of society. But importantly, this also spilled over into the army and police. So obviously, as I mentioned before, the role of the police was a really large factor in the building of this revolutionary movement. The harsh attacks of the students by the, by the French police force had persuaded the workers into solidarity action. And this could be seen through the signs that were being held in the protests and strikes. So the ones like, where are the missing injured? And this was despite, as I said, the majority of wounded being the police, the workers still stood with the students in disgust at the violent clampdown of the movement. And the workers saw the clamp down by the police and this had brought them into action. However, as the revolution progressed, the changes in consciousness were not just seen in the masses, but they were also seen in the police and the army. So it's of course true to say that the police and army hold a reactionary position in society. However, these armed bodies of men are made up by various sections of society. And this means that often armies and police can split along class lines in times of acute class struggle. And this occurred in the Russian Revolution, and it can be seen again here in the May 68 strikes. The army and police force were no longer reliable arms of the state um, that they had been even just a few weeks before. So an interview was taken with a French soldier in the midst of the movement, where a newspaper asked him if he would ever fire against workers, and he answered that he wouldn't, and that while he thought the workers' movement was perhaps slightly incorrect in their tactics, that he was the son of a worker and that he would never fire against his own. So obviously this is an anecdotal piece of evidence, but it paints a picture for what the mood and the rank and file of the army was. The mood in the army and police can often show as a decay in old society. Um, and what the French army really showed at this time was a divided and decaying system, which was really quickly crumbling beneath the feet of the ruling class. 
and even the police force were beginning to turn against the bourgeoisie. And they knew that the bourgeoisie was terrified of losing them in solidarity with the workers. And this is a really important thing to have an idea of when we talk about Paris 68. Because often as revolutionaries, we hear the argument that the state is too strong to beat. However, as time progresses, the ruling class becomes more and more divided and capitalism shows its scars. We know that at this time in France, the contradictions of capitalism hadn't been solved. The situation had turned on its head very quickly. And the changes in the ranks of the army show us not only the real picture of the May 68 revolution, but they show us what could be achieved in countries that pessimists write off because the state is supposedly like too strong. In an article from Serious Elements of the Bourgeoisie at the time, the question was raised, can de Gaulle rely on the army to help him? In the article, the posed question was answered with what I think was likely a correct analysis, that he could rely on the army once and no more. So one battle with workers would split the army into fragments that would be like almost impossible to recover. And this paints a picture of a situation where workers were more powerful relative to the state than they'd ever been before. And this really shows what could have been achieved by the revolutionary strike movement if this objective situation had been harnessed properly. This was an incredibly militant mood of the French masses, which could have spelled an end to capitalism in France. And yet, despite all of the incredible strength and militancy of the French working class, France is still a capitalist state. France is known as a nation where the working class always fight their struggles to the end. However, May 68 is the gaping exception to this rule. The French working class had won the struggle, but a socialist transformation of society didn't occur. So why was that? When studying past revolutionary movements, the biggest factor that always comes to light is leadership. A movement, however strong, with weak leaders will ultimately fall. There's a saying that goes about in Marxist circles that the working class will move when it's ready, not a minute before and not a minute after. And once the working class is ready to move, there is nothing that can stop them. However, no army can win without leaders. And in France at the time, the revolutionary working class had a leadership as weak and incompetent as the masses were strong. A revolutionary movement cannot be held in this state of white hot ferment forever. They must eventually either succeed or fail. A general strike, even the most revolutionary general strike in history, as this one was, only poses the question of power. It shows the workers that they have the power and that they can change the world. However, it's not an end in itself. It's a tactic which poses to the workers the question of whether to go back to work and hand back power to the bosses, or whether to take over the running of society and crush capitalism. The general, this general strike did exactly that, and the workers pushed to take over society. However, the leadership of the unions, as well as the Stalinist-dominated Communist Party, worked against the working class and pulled back the movement into this safe space of working within capitalism. So as you all know now, May 68 was not the start of a summer of successful revolutions which overthrew world capitalism, but actually a defeat of this mighty working class. And it's certainly not incredible to say that the working class could have easily overthrown capitalism at the time. But you don't have to believe me when I say this. Um, the thorough demoralization from the French ruling classes should be a good indicator of it though. So de Gaulle had escaped France to seek safety and as we heard from the French prime minister earlier, he believed that the working class were extremely strong. De Gaulle was a serious and sensible man. He wasn't an outlandish figure to represent the ruling class. We often talk about the ridiculousness of ruling class leaders being a mirror for the ridiculousness of capitalism at the time. Um, but as we know in France at the time, the economy was strong and supposedly stable. De Gaulle was a leader that represented this time he was a sensible and smart bourgeois politician. And the reason I say this isn't to like give de Gaulle any credit or anything, but is to make the point that he wouldn't have fled over nothing. His fear, along with the fear of the rest of the ruling class, showed the real objective situation. And to quote de Gaulle again, he said to the US ambassador, the game is up. In a few days, the communists will be in power. 
So here we come to the thoroughly disheartening part of the story, which is the weak and incompetent leadership that snatched defeat from the jaws of victory. If there'd been a strong and educated Marxist leadership um, at, the, at the helm of this movement, then the already organized workers' committees should have become the base of workers' power with a proper democratic centralism throughout the ranks. This should have taken the place of the state and been made national. And the bourgeois state could have been swept away. This was actually a demand that was already being raised by workers on May 27. As I said, the leadership didn't do this. The Stalinist Communist Party, along with the reformist trade unions, handed power back to the state. And this is a trend in trade union leaderships. It was similarly seen in the 1926 general strike in Britain. The leaders of the movement took a deal with the ruling class. So they were offered a raise in minimum wage, a cut in working hours, reduced age of retirement, a restoration of the right to organize and the resignation of the education minister. Obviously that's a drop in the ocean compared to what socialism can offer. But it does show how, again, shows how fearful the ruling class were and that they would give up so much so quickly. They really did think they'd lost at this point. And the leaders took this deal at great disappointment to the workers. There wasn't a mood to give up the strike and stop the fighting. In fact, the workers were more optimistic at this point than they had been in the whole, like in the whole movement. When the leaders gave back power to the ruling class, there was a huge amount of anger in the ranks of the movement. Alan Woods, who was present in Paris during the time, often talks about a situation where in one of the workplaces in France, as the union leader tried to talk of this success, he was, um, so the success of like this deal they'd taken, he was drowned out from the floor by chants of people calling for um, a popular or workers' government. And this shows the mood in the ranks concerning this betrayal. As I said earlier on, an army needs a leadership. And when the leaders betray their army, the army eventually capitulates. In France, this is exactly what happened. The workers went back to work and they tried to appreciate the reforms that they'd won. But in May 60, well, if May 68 teaches us like any important lesson, I know I've gone through quite a lot of important lessons, but I think this is the key. It's that when the state is in the hands of the ruling class, any reforms can be taken away and all economic problems will be paid for by the workers. So in November 1968, which is only six months later, there was an austerity bill passed through French government, which removed the bulk of the reforms. So this, show, this month of um, powerful and militant action by the workers ended in defeat at the hands of the leaders. And it ended in France being plummeted back into the ups and downs of capitalist society. But despite the May 68 movement, Despite this, the May 68 movement in France is a really inspiring and exciting movement to learn about. It teaches us many lessons about the class struggle, from solidarity um, to workers' power to leadership. And as revolutionaries, it's important that we learn the lessons of these past revolutions. May 68 is an extremely good movement to study and to learn the strengths and weaknesses of. Writing and giving this talk has given me a, like a great deal of hope in the power of a workers' movement, but also an unaltering belief that we need to build a Marxist organisation that is full of determined and educated revolutionaries. Because it is only by doing this that we know when a movement like this comes around again, the leaders will not hand back power to the ruling class. Thanks, that's all I'm going to say. Sammy, I think you're still muted, by the way. <laughs> yeah, sorry, the spotlight video is—it's uh, going crazy. Uh, can you can you see me? Yeah. yeah. Oh, wonderful. Okay. Um, brilliant. Well, thank you very much. That was awesome. Um, great. Well, so uh, I'll give you guys some time to uh, you know formulate some questions uh, or some I don't know. Well, questions preferably over uh, interventions or anything like that. Um, yeah, it's um, here we go. Let's have a look. Um, there's one come up already that I'd like to answer if that's okay, Sammy. 
Yes. Yeah, so um, somebody has asked, uh, why weren't the leaders of the unions replaced by the workers with their own representatives? Um, the leaders betrayed them, so what to stop the working class from selecting a better leadership? I think that's a really good point. I mean, I obviously, like, um, I I wish that that is what had been done. Um, I, I, I wasn't there. I don't know what, like, was in the minds of... Um, of the workers in the movement at the time, um, but I think that uh, I think that we have to remember that this movement had happened very quickly, um, as I like outlined at the start. It wasn't the case that this was um, a movement like, uh, for example, like October um, nineteen seventeen, where they'd uh, where they'd had like a, um, a a very big revolutionary movement in the um, in the February, and it had been like building up and all of these things were kind of like you could see like the workers power and where it was building and stuff this sort of seemed to happen quite suddenly of course all the processes for it were going on under the surface but it wasn't the case that there'd been this like um organized uh like um move towards the movement and i think that's probably a big part of it and i also think that probably like wasn't anyone that much better so one of the um one of the people that's well known in this movement was um, was uh, da Danny the Red. I can't remember his exact name, but he was one of the student leaders, and he was um, he was an anarchist, and uh, again, I think like had quite confused politics and things that wouldn't really have built the movement. But he was kind of a bit of a, a leader amongst the student movement, and I think that was like this almost accidental leadership again, as I spoke of. But I think the fact that he was the leadership of the student movement shows like as i outlined the fact that there weren't there wasn't really um like a strong revolutionary organization in any situation like it just it didn't exist in france at that time these like so called revolutionaries were looking for other things and like not trying to help build this movement um i actually listened to a uh, to a talk by alan woods um the other day on his experiences and he was talking about being in an anarchist meeting at the time and the kind of um, the uh, the abstract nature with which they were talking about this strike that was literally like building under their noses, like it was it was there. Workers were coming into the meeting and trying to like say, you know, we need organisation, we need leadership, and like no one was really like all these anarchists were like, oh no, we can't have leadership and stuff. So I think just like there was this like incompetence from anyone who could have been a leadership. There wasn't a leadership there to take over. Obviously, I wish there had been, and that is why I like why I spend a lot of my time trying to build a revolutionary organization so that it can be there in the future um, but yeah I hope that answered that question awesome awesome um, would you like to go on to uh, answer any further questions that we have yeah if there's nobody who wants to nobody's put their hand up and wants to come in or anything oh yes oh, actually God. Oh, Keelan. Hi. Yeah, I'll let Keelan speak before I keep speaking. Here we go. Hello, Keelan. Hello. Hi. Um, yeah, I don't know. Don't... Oh. Hmm. Keelan, you've gone. Yeah, hello. Um, thanks for the talk, uh, Sarah. That was fantastic. Um, I, just, I just thought I'd talk a bit about um, the events uh, in Mexico, because obviously the, the French Revolution of 1968 wasn't the only uh, outbreak of the air. Um, and, and I'm hoping other comrades can come in on the events in uh, in, in Prague and in Pakistan. Um, but yeah, I just want to discuss uh, what went down in Mexico um, and that, culminate, that culminated ultimately with the uh, Tlatelolco, um, I don't know if I pronounced that right, to be honest, uh, Tlatelolco massacre uh, on the 2nd of October. Um, so just as Sarah was saying about France, um, the development of capitalism in the post-war period laid the, the sort of crucial foundations for this movement in Mexico as well. Um, and so I'm sort of weary of uh, going into the, the uh, Mexican Revolution too much because we're discussing it next week. Um, but I'll just like outline some of the basic things uh, to explain it. So, um, you know, the, the Mexican Revolution contained a, a massive agrarian uh, movement. It was an agrarian revolution. Uh, in terms of like a, it was a peasant peasant based movement uh, like along the lines of uh, agrarian, agrarianismo uh, from Emiliano Zapata and things like this. But it was also uh, as much a bourgeois revolution 
in, in, in the sense. Uh, and you, what you see um, is, is essentially you have a situation where pre-revolutionary Mexico had developed along capitalist lines under the dictator Porfirio Diaz, um, but many of the feudal relations had remained um, in terms of haciendas and, and so on. Um, and particularly foreign investment was discouraged from investing in Mexico in a, in a major way um, because they were, they were, uh, it was limited by concerns about the capability of the Mexican state to maintain property rights, and which was ultimately a fear that was justified by the events of 1910 to 1920 with the Mexican Revolution, because the, the Mexican state disintegrated. Um, but this, anyways, the aftermath of this revolution, uh, so, and particularly after the period of Cardenismo, so from 1940 onwards, you get the ma massively rapid development of Mexican uh, capitalism. Um, and so this means that you, you have a situation where uh, industry accounts for 22% of GDP in 1950, and it goes on to account for 24% in 1960 and 29% in 1970. And this is an economy, this is, so it's, it's uh, the, the role of industry is growing in the Mexican economy. And it's also an economy that was growing itself at a rate of about 7% GDP through the 1960s. So this is the immense development of the productive forces. And of course, the, therefore the corresponding development of the Mexican working class. The Mexico of the Mexican Revolution was an overwhelmingly uh, agrarian society. Uh, and of course, it still was mainly agrarian even in uh, the 1960s. But had there not been this, this massive upswing of Mexican capitalism in the period, you would, would have not seen this movement uh, develop also. So it was just, uh, so there's really strong parallels uh, to be laid, which is why you have these uh, these moments in history, right, where you have revolutionary outbreaks occurring almost simultaneously, is because the objective conditions of, uh, for them have developed uh, in, in tandem with each other. And I think that what's actually, you know, really inspiring for us as, as revolutionaries today is, you know, look at the situation on a worldwide scale now. We've seen you know, we've seen the development in the, the, uh, of, of the proletariat even more so. The proletariat uh, was stronger, uh, you know, as Sarah pointed out, the, the proletariat was far stronger in the 1960s than it was in the 30s. And then when it, when it was in the Paris Commune, both moments at which the French working class could have taken power. You know, the, the French working class now is even stronger and the world proletariat is even stronger. Um, and and that, so it, if anything, it emphasizes even more so uh, what Sarah was saying of the necessity to provide the leadership capable of, of, uh, of channeling such an, uh, an immense force uh, to victory. Thanks, Keelan. That's yeah, that was um, really interesting. I don't know a lot about uh, Mexico, so I'm excited to hear the talk next week. Everyone should make sure to uh, come along. Um, I've got, uh, Sammy, are you okay if I answer a couple of these questions after Q&A? Is that all right? You're muted, but cool. I'm just going to do it. <laughs> yeah, go for it. Sorry. <laughs> cool. Um, yeah, so there's this question. Um, there's a question I'll, I'll come back to in a second because I feel like Keelan's mostly answered um, mostly answered it, but um, yeah, I will answer it a bit more in a second. So the first one I wanted to answer is, um, when's the right time to pose the question of a general strike? And further on from that, when is the right time to seize power for the workers? So that's a really good question because um, like a general strike is not something to be played around with. We shouldn't just sort of raise the question of a general strike um, like frivolously um we shouldn't be you know putting up an event on facebook every week calling for a general strike this isn't that's not how to build the workers movement but i also can't really give you a concrete answer to this um because i don't think there is one um this has to be it has to be done in the time um we have to know what the movement is uh, we have to know what's happening in the um in the movement to really be able to know when to pose these kind of questions. So um, as I said, like about consciousness, this is kind of the big thing for um, what a revolution is, right? It's like, is the masses actually being involved in society, being involved in politics in a way that they haven't been involved with before. Mm -hmm. Politics obviously is kind of made to push, um, politics is kind of made for like to push uh, to push working class people out of it, um, or at least bourgeois politics. Um, and a revolution is where people where people start to change that and start to really come into politics. And 
being able to see to see that and see how people's consciousness is changing within that is kind of how you have to judge for when a general strike um, when we should be calling for a general strike when we should be calling specifically for workers power it's not yeah it's not this like um like sort of uh um one size fits all idea that we can just say cool well when there's 10 million people striking that's when we say like it's uh, yeah when there's 10 million people like when there's these big workplaces complaining then that's when we say we need a general strike and like it doesn't work like that we have to like look at the consciousness of people and that I think um that's kind of why I was talking about the ideas of academic Marxism or academic Marxism and um and why like why I think that that's kind of an impotent way of doing things because <coughs> like you can't really understand the movement unless you're actively participating in it. I can read everything that Marx has ever written but if I'm not like there in the movement analyzing the movement through a Marxist method then I don't know what the consciousness of those people is and I don't know how to make sure that those people um how to like raise the right questions for the time and stuff um, and that's the what looking at things through a Marxist method is and like acting as a revolutionary is um, so yeah I think um, it, it depends on the movement it depends on what's going on but I think the big thing is to um, uh, is to be in the movement and be looking at everything through a Marxist lens and, lens and analyzing things and when consciousness is developing and people are people are wanting to move further um that like you have to raise these questions but yeah it's sorry that was kind of a like it, it doesn't have a clear answer basically is my answer <laughs> um lovely stuff yeah is that, does anyone else want to come in yeah can we can we get a, a hand raised anyone want to come in make a, an intervention make a few points or something just so you don't have to hear me speak non-stop have a different kind of accent maybe <laughs> um, while people think about that um i will answer this question that's from the youtube um from the youtube uh, like live stream of this um that i said keelan kind of partly answered um and i'll just try and like fill in a little bit more so says so one thing that surprises me about the worldwide revolutionary movements in 1968 is that they took place in this period of upswing, um, albeit towards the end of the post-war boom. How is this the case? Um, obviously, I think Keelan like did a good job of answering the majority of that in terms of um, in terms of like the strength of uh, the strength of the proletariat and the fact that they were stronger at that point than they'd ever been, um, which I think is an important part of that uh, of that answer. Um, but I don't think it's only that. I think that um, I think that as I was saying, like the wealth disparity was getting more, and um, like people might have been getting richer, but they were also seeing the sort of unbelievable levels of wealth that were starting to develop that were really like kind of gross to watch. Um, and um, I think also we we talk. Uh, Marx like mentions. I can't remember. Um, whether it's in the manifesto that he mentions this, it's in one of those like classic um, ABCs of Marxism pieces. Um, he talks about the needs need to be fulfilled, whether they're like needs of the stomach or um, needs of the imagination. And what he means by that is that, um, of course, like uh, um, like bread and land, <laughs> um, uh, the key piece bread and land are like the the key things. They're the like the needs of of um, the stomach, right? Like the things that you like absolutely need to survive. Um, but the, as society develops, we develop needs that maybe aren't like basic needs of subsistence just for, for humans, but actually develop as society develops. So one of the things I think is a good example of this is like during the um, during the uh, general election, uh, the 2019 general election, there was this whole debate over broadband um, and whether broadband is like a right, right? Because like the, Jeremy Corbyn was talking about free broadband. Um, and I think this is like, it's a good example of it because obviously you don't need broadband to just survive. 
but the society that we've created means that you need broadband to apply for a job you need it to um order food maybe if you're like can't get out you need it to um to be able to like have any like so at this point have any sort of socialization any sort of um any sort of like community around you um and all of these sort of things so that's an example of like a need that's in the imagination and I think that was part of what was starting to develop in um in uh, France at the time really was um was they were seeing that more could be achieved um and they were seeing these uh like society was starting to develop into this point where you needed to have a car and uh, like um a bit of a better house and stuff just to like to be able to live an average life you needed to have these things so it kind of developed into uh, people wanting more and more um not in like a greedy way but in like a um in a way that they should like they were being exploited by the system and the richest were getting much much richer um so people were seeing that and they wanted to uh they wanted to be able to get to like develop more for themselves basically um yeah i think hopefully that was a answer yes we um we have a hands up from a beverly dickens Amazing. bringing bringing you in now on mute can you hear me yeah, I can. Okay, I've just had to join the, the webinar late, so I was asking if you could bear to give a short recap of the key points. So if you don't want to, the other question is, is there any recording of this I can, um, can listen to? Because I've, I've really enjoyed the other webinars I've come to. Yeah, of course. Um, there are recordings of it, but just to, I'll give like a brief, like, I'll try and make it very brief, just of the key, the absolute key points. Um, that I uh, that I think came out of this lead off. So I think there are a few things where I said like you know this is a um, this is a important point to talk about. Um, I think one was um, sorry. Let me just scroll down. Um, there was this point about like solidarity about student worker solidarity. Um, point about the uh the army um and the um the sort of uh the like the army splitting along class lines and this being very useful for a revolutionary movement um and then leadership is the key point really but yeah we we've recorded this in a few different places i'm sure i think someone's actually just sent the link um on the chat so hopefully you can watch that and then that'll be uh that'll be useful for you thank you I'm glad you enjoyed them in general. It's really good. Really, really, yeah, fantastic. Great. Thank you. Um, okay, cool. I am going to try and answer another question if nobody wants to come in. Um, let me just have a look. Sorry, let me just have a read through these questions. Is there anything you want to say, Sammy, about like the just generally? Um, I had a very sort of um I was thinking about um dialectical materialism and um you, you mentioned about um like potential energy and um sorry I'm having problems uh having problems with Zoom uh as per the norm. Give me a second, sorry. No, that's fine. Um yeah, so I was uh, there's this process I found out um like called sublimation uh which is where essentially here we go lovely which is basically where um a a solid can transform immediately into a gas state without having to necessarily go through a liquid state um i know that sounds really dull but what I, i've learned about that and it just made me think of potential energy of the working class and and um, the, like contradicting theories of uh, like stage theory of the Mensheviks and the Bolsheviks and in the Russian Revolution. Um, but generally, this 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 what I think this proves is that, as you have said in your lead off, if the conditions allow for transformation, uh, then you know it can and it it will happen. Um, it's like 
like a, a sort of very basic example is just sort of like, I don't know, dry ice. Like it's, it's a solid, but it has this gas that changes, you know, the temperature of the room around it. It's, I know it sounds a bit daft, but that constant transformation is, uh, is kind of very similar to how we're going to change society is, you know, what we are influenced by, we, we transform because of it, but then as a result of that transformation, the working class's transformation into, you know, being more organised, into actually consciousness elevating and so on, um, that, that in turn then transforms society and that what initially transformed us, we then transform, which is again uh, like a unity of opposites. Um, and uh, like that, that is the sort of process that I think you've, uh, you've obviously outlined um, about these events. But that's, that was just something I found very uh, helpful to just break down what the process of revolution is. Um, so yeah, that's, that's all I'll say, I won't, I won't say any more. Um, would you like to answer a question or would you like to, uh, we have a hand up. Come in. Yeah, let's, yeah, let's let Laurie come in and then I can, yeah. I'd like to answer him some questions. Hello, Laurie. Sorry, I'll move so that I'm not like in the shadows. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, hi guys. I just, I really enjoyed the talk, Sarah. Um, and one of the things I think is really fascinating and amazing about May 68 and actually the whole like revolutionary year of 1968 is how it really like reactivated the class class struggle and and struggle in general which have been like pretty dormant during the the post-war boom and I think a lot of people really see May 68 as a defeat um and I don't think that we should be kind of you know, we shouldn't be flippant about it because you know it was a defeat in many ways you know the french working class could have taken power uh, and and the world working class could have taken power and that would have you know completely changed society as we know it for the better um and they didn't and that was a big loss but there are a lot of uh gains that were made out of it that i think we should really acknowledge and one of them is something that's not really talked about very much. But um, last year was the 50th anniversary of the Stonewall riots, which happened in uh, 1969. And it's what we like basically talk about as the start of the modern LGBT rights movement. Um, and what happened basically was that uh, people just got very sick of all of the repression um and being being gay in america was like it was very difficult and uh, a bar called the, the stonewall bar got raided by the police and it immediately overnight transformed into a mass demonstration uh and it's very interesting because if you read kind of histories of the stonewall riots of which there aren't very many um there's a couple documentaries people are very confused about what was happening people are like oh i don't really know why all, you know all of the gay people suddenly got really tired or, i don't really know how this mass demonstration happened and some people actually say like a lot of historians actually say oh well it's because judy garland had died recently and so everyone was just very sad and it you know it was just the straw that broke the camel's back and, you know it, it, this is the kind of flippancy with which bourgeois academia treats mass movements um but actually if you read like the accounts of what was happening at the time they have been these are people that have been inspired by the movements uh, that had happened in the previous year and they learned that um that basically that mass action pays the the, the demonstrations work that, that coming out onto the streets you know collectively is is the only power that we really have. And it wasn't like, if you read, it wasn't just like gay people that were joining in the demonstrations. If, uh, like you read the accounts at the time and there's people that were involved in like the 1968 protests. There's people that were involved in like the anti-Vietnam War demonstrations that were happening at the same time. Um, and it, you know, it was that movement 
which in many ways like owes itself to the lessons of 1968 and owes itself to this like fantastic energetic revolutionary mood that um that that kind of really shone through like in 68 that basically laid the basis for most of the gains of like the modern day lgbt rights movement and <laughs> if that can come out of a defeat then think about what could have come out of a victory um which i i think is incredibly inspiring um so i think now you know we're gonna see movements now which are even bigger than than 68 was and we already saw in 2019 these like huge mass movements of liberation of revolution like in algeria and sudan like spreading across latin america um and and you know and you know that's only the beginning uh so i think like taking the lessons of the last 50 years we can be incredibly inspired and, and, and we can learn from these defeats but we can also learn like all, all of these movements are a step forward um the the class learns from it we learn from it and, and you know that's why it's so important to discuss it I, i'm gonna end there but i just thought that would be an interesting point to make yeah thank you that was super interesting um I actually like it made me think a bit about um, sort of the this idea of like the struggles being um, unified and uh, and um, like we should be able to like fight uh, fight as a class right not um so uh, yeah just because Laurie was talking um, very well about the uh, the LGBT movements that came off the back of this and it's kind of this proof to me that these movements. Um, don't just uh, they don't just spring up independently as Laurie was saying like these movements are um, are uh, like bounce off each other and um, and come from um, the power that one movement can give to another movement um, and the LGBT uh, the, the LGBT movement um, here in Stonewall was not it wasn't this separate thing to the class struggle in France it was entirely unified and that's a really important point to make um, about what can, um, like what what needs to be done to fight uh, against any kind of oppression, and it's kind of seen um, in just May '68 as well. Because as I said, like this movement came from this uh, this um, question about uh, male and female um, students being able to visit each other's dorms, and then snowballed into a much wider movement, which. Um, which was taken on like socialist and uh, revolutionary ideas, um, and that like the that these things um, come together and link up so much is really uh, is a really important point about how we have to fight for these things. Like we can't fight for um, LGBT liberation, we can't fight for women's liberation um, without fighting for socialism in general, without fighting for socialist ideas. Um, yeah, that really highlighted that for me. So thank you, Laurie. Um, I want to just answer um, a question, unless anyone, okay, someone has got their hand up, but I'm going to answer this question first and then they can come in. Um, so someone's asked, how would pol politics policy um, uh, be governed if we didn't have a state and government institutions to govern them? Um, so this is a really interesting question. Uh, I would recommend reading, um, reading Lenin's State and Revolution um, for like to get a general idea of um, what the what the state is and what it does. Um, and I would also recommend looking into the aftermath of the 1905 revolution in Russia, because what that really showed, what, what happened after 1905 was that Soviets began to be created. And I think we often think about Soviets as this thing that were, or bourgeois history will tell us that Soviets were this thing that was like pushed down by Lenin and this hugely undemocratic thing. That's definitely not what happened. Um, Soviets were um, a spontaneous, uh, a spontaneous creation by the um, peasantry and the working class in Russia at the time. Um, and they created this like embryo of, of workers' power that was then um, given uh, much fuller reins of, um, of like national organization after 1917. 
And this, I think, is a model that we should that we should follow. Um, not a model given to us by like the mind of the mind of someone writing a book and like talking about it theoretically, but a model that was given to us by the Russian workers and that has been given to us whether the leadership was asking for it or not, it's been given to us by almost every revolutionary movement in history. And May 68, again, shows this. They had these workers' councils that I spoke about, which is basically what a Soviet is, um, that was making decisions um, in terms of like organising the new society once um, when capitalism was being shut down, basically. Um, and that I think is uh, is exactly the model that we should follow. So as I said, <coughs> as I said in the talk, um, if there'd been a proper Marxist leadership in place, what they should have done was make these groups like link these groups up nationally and give them proper democratic centralism. So proper democracy, proper like um, proper like uh, leaders being held to account. Um, throughout the ranks of these workers' councils that were already existing, were already there as the embryo, um, and that I think is how you uh, how you create a political system without um, the state in the current form is giving um, that uh, role over to the workers in this truly democratic way and allowing them to begin to organise society for themselves um, through these institutions. Uh, yeah, I think that's everything we can bring someone else in now. Awesome. Yes, would you like me to bring in Harvey? Yeah, cool. There we go. Hi comrades, how are you doing? Um, I'm just going to make a, a quick intervention. Um, so yeah, out of all the things which I there's a lot of really important lessons to take. So it's maybe a bit of this one to resonate with me was about uh, how academic Marxists, like we, how like we should be aware that it is just often navel gazing. You know, I think it's perhaps resonated with me today, given that a lot of the reading I've been doing for my research. But, um, you know, I think at best you end up conceiving of class in like, you know, sometimes in an abstract and consistent way. Excuse me, Harvey, sorry. Um, or you end up just like getting sick. Sorry, um, your internet seems to be unstable, so we're losing a lot of what uh, you're uh, No worries. Um, I'll drop out then and let someone else come in, not to worry. Are you sure? Are you sure? Yeah, yeah, sure thing, yeah. Yeah. Sorry okay. about that. We're hearing you all right now, if you want to continue. Um, yeah, yeah, so, um, yeah, what was I saying? Um, no, 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 it's fine, don't worry. Um, so, yeah, it was about just how, like, you know, if it's sort of just academic Marxism, it's it's sort of just navel-gazing, and you often think of class in either an abstract way, or you end up mixing together ideas in a really funky way, and then you end up denying class exists like Giddens did, um, or you just end up sort of denying class from the outset. Um, like a lot of academics do. I read a piece today from 1959 which said, you know, class can surely be important for historical sociology, but in the present day, it's clearly outdated, you know? And I think, uh, it, but it, I think, you know, that piece in 1959, it was clearly affected by the post-war boom, right? That sort of jubilation, which the, which the, uh, which sort of the bourgeoisie greeted it with. And but this didn't just affect the academics, right? It also did affect the leaders of the workers' movement. I think Alan is really fond of telling a story about uh, Mandel, who said in January of 1968 that there won't be a movement of the French workers for decades, at least. Um, you know, this is, this is the supposed leadership of a fourth international at the time, right? Um, and yeah, I think it's sort of, you know, in this sort of... Um, you know, more generally, I think it links to the idea of sort of, you know, when you sort of treat Marxism as like an academic idea, or you just treat class as like a quirky little tool of analysis and not really, you know, a guide for political action and stuff, um, you end up losing its significance. And you sort of, you know, I, I read a piece today as well, where it was sort of, you know, you have these academics saying, well, you know, Marx and Engels will talk about three classes, and that's just outdated, you know, it's not relevant to contemporary society. This model with 12 is much better instead. However, when, when it comes to analysis, it's often better to group these classes together. So, 
we often find that a group in three different groups works for really good for analysis. You know, you find these academics jumping through hoops to try and reinvent the wheel. But I think the only ideas which have really stood the test that have been the ideas of Marxism. You know, it's the only ones which have been you know consistently correct. You know, how many times we heard class decried? How many times we heard class sort of you know reinvented? And yet, it's ideas of Marx and Engels. You know, we read the Communist Manifesto. I think everyone's first reaction is, you know, while this reads like it was written yesterday. Um, but linked to the idea that it's not just sort of, you know, navel gaze and it's the importance of using Marxism, using the method, um, because it is a correct method. It's also the idea that, you know, we shouldn't just use it as a, a way to understand society, but as a way to change it. Marx was very clear on that himself. So I'll just, I'll just end up my intervention by sort of, um, but yeah, just again with an appeal for like, if you're not already, get involved with your local Marxist society, get involved with your local socialist appeal branch and, and join us in changing the world. Because, you know, while these sort of trendy academics come and go and talk about the French working class never moving, you know, the French working class will move and the British working class will move and we've got to be ready for it. Thank you. Thanks, Harvey. That was a really good point. Um, I want to just uh, read, somebody's um, put in the question and answer bit, an answer to the um, the general strike question that I think is probably better than the answer that um, I give. So I, I want to read it because I think it's useful to hear from other people. Um, yeah, so they wrote, um, the call for a general strike arises out of the economic and political situation, if the situation warrants it. It's also a demand that will be raised by the working class itself. A call for a general strike can be useful in galvanizing in the class over a single issue, um, as the calls for general strikes 10 years ago over the Cameron pension rules, however, um, flexibility is key on this issue. And I think that's a really um, important point, like this idea of flexibility. Um, that's uh, what, a, what a revolutionary leadership really needs to have is, um, is the ability to be completely flexible with its tactics, not with its principles. Um, Marxist leadership should have, uh, should have firm principles, um, but it should be able to be revolutionary with its tactics. And that's uh, um, something that it takes time to learn um, and it takes time to build yourself to be able to to be able to do that but it is really the key of of successful um revolutionary leaderships because uh, if you if you can't um orientate yourself to what the working class is worried about then what's the point and this comes again back to the idea of dogma that i was speaking about before the fact that the point is not to just read marx and parrot back everything that he says but to read them and understand how to um, how to look at um, society from like that position from from this Marxist method, um, and that what that gives you is is real flexibility to look at what the issues that are being um, what the issues that are coming up now are, um, and sometimes that does mean like it's exactly as Harvey said, like people read the manifesto and they say this feels so modern because ultimately we're still living under capitalism. Um, and sometimes it is just like giving someone a piece of that, like of Marx's work and saying, look, look, see how like see how much of this is still relevant. But sometimes it's it's taken those ideas and it's been able to apply them to people's specific situations. Um, yeah, and I think that's really that flexibility really is the key. Um, and it's what both reformists and um, opportunists, I guess, um, really lack is this ability to be flexible. And this and this is kind of like highlighted in the fact that they were saying that like the bourgeois and um, sorry, the working class have been bourgeoisified, right? Because that in itself is this like um, this idea that right they're gone now like we can't we'll we'll never win back the European working class which was obviously proved incorrect within a matter of weeks of them of them saying it but um yeah it really shows like that need to have flexibility in the movement um yeah I think that's all the question and answer questions um and if there's no one else who wants to come in yeah it looks like that's it's drawn naturally to a close there and unless it yeah um brilliant i I'll think that can i say like one more thing then yeah um, go on back on 
yeah just, um yeah i think it's been like a super interesting um discussion so thank you to everyone who came in um and uh yeah as i said i think the the key to this movement um the key to uh, the defeat um of this movement was the leadership so yeah everyone um needs to help build if you believe in the like socialist transformation of society you need to come and help build um, a revolutionary organization in order to do that job. Awesome. Join Socialist Appeal. <laughs> Brilliant. Right. Um, I think we'll end it there. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Brilliant. Take yeah. care, everyone. We're living through a decisive turning point in history. Tens of thousands of people are dying. The world economy is in freefall. This is the barbarism of the capitalist system. It can't be patched up. It must be replaced. We have the resources to meet everyone's needs and the planet. A rational, planned, socialist economy is possible. A society based on need, not profit. But we have to fight for it. We need to get educated in revolutionary theory and history. We need to spread our ideas and we need to organise ourselves. So join Socialist Appeal, the Marxist and the Labour and Student Movement. Join our study groups, spread our online material and start getting organised with us. We're faced with an historic challenge and an historic opportunity. Seize this moment. Change the world.